Good evening. We're going to begin our virtual workshop on San Diego Complete Communities. Next slide, please. This workshop is being hosted by the City of San Diego and facilitated by the Institute for Local Government. My name is Erica Manuel, and I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the Institute, and I'll be your moderator today. Just as a housekeeping note, all of your lines have been muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you have any technical difficulties during this workshop session, please feel free to type your question or concern at any time by typing it into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. We are recording today's webinar and we'll share the recording, the slide deck, and any related resources with all the registrants via the city's website very soon. So this slide shows us the purpose of today's meeting and it's really to inform as many of you as possible about three initiatives from the city of San Diego, Play Everywhere, Mobility Choices, and Housing Solutions. We're gonna hear some basic information about those initiatives and provide the latest updates we're going to share some public feedback and input that the city's already received about these initiatives and proposals, and we're going to clarify how and when you communicate about them and the proper channels to do so. And last but not least, we're going to test out some different technology for this, platform, uh, for this web workshop. We have a few technology platforms we want to test for you. We're piloting some of these virtual engagement tools, and we want to see how it works. Next slide. Our speakers today are experts from the City of San Diego, and you should be able to see them at the top of your screen. We have Mike Hansen, the Director of San Diego's Planning Department. We have Heidi Von Bloom, a Program Manager of Environment and Mobility Planning. And we have Brian Schoenfish, a Program Manager of Community Planning and Implementation. Next slide. We're also joined by a few of my colleagues at the Institute for Local Government. Handling our meeting logistics and polling will be Melissa Keene and Hannah Stelmakovich who you might hear and or see on the screen during this workshop. Next slide. So on to today's agenda. Uh, in terms of the agenda, we do understand that there may be varying degrees of familiarity with each of the three initiatives we're gonna talk about. And so we're going to spend some time setting the stage and providing an overview of each proposal. And we'll also share some new information for those of you that may be somewhat familiar, maybe you've heard about some of these already. As I mentioned, we're leaning into this virtual environment that the COVID now requires. So we're also going to integrate some survey and polling technology into the workshop so that you can get real-time thoughts about life in San Diego, the kinds of resources and amenities you value most, and really where your priorities lie. We're gonna wrap up the workshop with a, a brief Q&A session. Um, and we started right at six o'clock and we are hoping to end right at six o'clock. Next slide or sorry, right at eight o'clock if I said six. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how this workshop will work. Uh, I know a lot of us, if you're anything like the ILG team, have been sheltering in place for at least four months, um, but every technology solution is just a little bit different. And so for virtual meetings, we really do like to, to clarify some technical details. So first things first, this virtual meeting platform is designed for large numbers of participants. We had over 300 people register and could be even more on site. And so everyone will remain on mute for the duration of the presentation to reduce background noise. If you have any questions during the workshop, please type your questions into one of two boxes. And if you're on a computer, they'll show up on the right-hand side of your screen. Questions about meeting logistics or technical difficulties can be asked and answered in the chat box. The chat box is where we will monitor um, any questions about issues that you're experiencing related to sound or other confusion. Questions about the presentation or questions for our panelists should be asked in the Q&A box. And those will be answered during the Q&A portion of this meeting and at the end of the agenda. So with over 300 participants, as we mentioned, uh, we do wanna give a disclaimer that we may not get to every single question that you ask, but we will do our absolute best to focus on the key themes we're seeing and get to as many as possible in the time that we have allowed. We have a team behind the scenes trying to collate uh, the comments that we get. We do know that you are participating in this session on your own personal time, so as I mentioned, we will honor our commitment to ending on time at 8 p.m. Next slide. Before we dive into the panel presentations, I wanna tell you just a little bit about ILG and our role in this virtual workshop. As I mentioned during my introduction, my name is Erica Manuel. I am the CEO and Executive Director of the Institute for Local Government. ILG is a statewide nonprofit organization that we're focused on helping assisting local agencies. 
We provide practical and easy to use resources so local agencies can effectively implement programs on the ground. We are nonprofit, we are nonpartisan, and we are here to help. Next slide. ILG administers the Boost Pilot Program with funding from the California Strategic Growth Council. And San Diego is one of the 10 cities and two regions that were selected to participate in that program. This workshop is part of our work with the city to explore issues around program and programs around sustainability, equity, uh, engagement, resilience, and climate. And we know we work statewide. These are critical issues facing a lot of communities throughout California. And San Diego's actually done a really great job and they're very interested in exploring innovative programs to make sure that the entire city remains vibrant and sustainable for all of its residents. Next slide. So before we dive into San Diego's Complete Communities Initiatives, we're going to hear a few words from our meeting host with the City of San Diego. The city is working hard, like I mentioned, to deliver on a mission of creating equitable, healthy, and sustainable neighborhoods, um, preferably ones that are diverse, that are walkable, that are connected, that are safe and inclusive. And, and those aren't just buzzwords, those are real meaningful changes. And so um, to tell us more about that effort and how it's going, we're gonna hear from Mike Hansen. As I mentioned, Mike is the director of San Diego's uh, planning department. He's got some general context for us and he's gonna provide a high level overview of the Complete Communities Initiative. He's also gonna explain how these initiatives prioritize climate and equity. And he's gonna give an overview of outreach efforts to date, um, just a high level one. And Mike, thank you for being here and we'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Erica. And good evening, everyone. I'd first like to uh, thank you all for joining tonight. We have a really great turnout. Uh, and uh, we're really excited and pleased to present to you today our Complete Communities Mobility Choices, Housing Solutions, and Play Everywhere initiatives. Complete Communities is an integrated land use and transportation planning strategy to implement the city's general plan, and that's our uh, growth blueprint and our, and our landmark climate action plan, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions and improves air quality and public health. A foundational principle shared across all complete communities initiatives is a focus on prioritizing our city's resources where the needs are greatest. The programs we are presenting today cover areas of mobility, housing, parks, and infrastructure. And these programs are based on extensive public outreach conducted over multiple years and continuous feedback from many public hearings, workshops, online surveys, and public comment periods. Together, these programs will provide more mobility choices to meet our climate goals, create incentives to build more affordable homes near transit, and quickly bring uh, parks and neighborhood benefits where we need them the most. The programs complement each other by providing an enhanced level of infrastructure investment surrounding the areas of the city where the needs are the greatest. And as we move forward with implementation actions, with these implementation actions, we are fortunate to be building on a very strong foundation here in the city of San Diego, uh, a foundation of planning goals and principles. And what I mean by that is that in 2008, the city adopted uh, its general plan and city villages strategy. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And in 2015, we adopted the climate action plan, uh, another landmark citywide planning document. And there's broad consensus in the city that we should be implementing the vision set forth in these two plans. Because of the many years of extensive public outreach and also that went into the general plan and climate action plan, and also the forward thinking action taken by previous city councils, we now are a city with a shared answer to such questions as, where in our city should we focus growth and investment? Should climate change be a guiding principle for our planning? And what action should we take to implement these visions? Today, we are speaking about three direct implementation actions of the Climate Action Plan and General Plan. The Climate Action Plan specifically calls for improving mobility choices, reducing vehicle miles traveled, and achieving more transit supportive densities in our transit priority areas. The General Plan, calls for retrofitting older neighborhoods to add new parks and creating a new parks master plan. It also calls for a reversal of the disinvestment and in infrastructure experience in some communities and a new equitable prioritization and funding. In many ways, setting a vision is the easy part 
and rolling up our sleeves and putting it into place is the hard part. Too many years of hard work and public input went into the general plan and climate action plan to let them sit on a shelf and gather dust. If we did that, it would mean our climate targets are merely aspirational words on paper and our housing goals wouldn't be realized. And most importantly, that our public resources won't be prioritized in the communities that need them the most. We can't support that and we won't let that happen. So that's why we're taking action to implement the vision that we as a city have said that we have. We also developed these programs to implement state law and to tailor that to our unique local conditions and characteristics. It's important to emphasize that local implementation of these state bills helps ensure that we as the city of San Diego, that we preserve our local planning authority. And that means the ability to shape our own future. Not taking action would jeopardize, uh, jeopardize that and jeopardize our local independence. And of course, for any draft proposals such as these, new ideas and differences of opinion will and should occur. Throughout the process, we've made adjustments as, uh, as we've received public input, and we anticipate that more could be made to reflect the new input being provided. Even after City Council, uh, when, we, when we adopt an initiative, we will monitor the success and we closely, uh, closely keep track of our benchmarks, make additional modifications as needed. We always do that for our major planning initiatives. And in fact, the city of San Diego has one of the most robust uh, code update programs in the states. And that means that on a regular basis, we evaluate our programs and then we recommend adjustments and improvements to the city council as needed. And this ensures that our programs can adapt to new conditions, new priorities, new public values, and be a lasting success. And we look forward to tonight's workshop and are excited to uh, have so many participants. Thank you all for joining. Excellent, Mike, thank you. Um, and really, I, I think that context is really helpful for the remainder of our conversation. Um, so, next slide. So you've heard a little bit from us and at this point in the presentation, we would like to know um, who's on the line. You can't see our faces, but we definitely want to know who's joined us tonight. So please do us a favor and tell us about yourself. We have three poll questions that are going to help our panelists better plan for your questions. Um, my colleagues, Melissa and Hannah, as I mentioned, are working behind the scenes to administer this poll. So you should see questions pop up directly on your screen if you're on a computer. And I'm going to ask them to proceed and I'll read those questions out loud. The first one is, it's a softball. How long have you lived in San Diego? Less than a year, one to five years, five to 10 years, or more than 10 years? And as soon as we get the results, we'll show you what, uh, what comes out. It looks like most of you have been in the city for more than 10 years, the vast majority are five to five years or more, and then about 10% have been here less than five years. That's really helpful. All right, we've got one more question, two more questions, uh, one more. Are you a member of a community planning group? There are a number of people working uh, with the city on, on planning, and are you a member of one of those groups? Please select yes or no. Uh, looks like 44% of you are part of a community planning group and 56% are not. Um, that means you may or may not have uh, the same information. So we will do our best to, like I said, provide an overview uh, for everyone. And then uh, we'll be able to answer questions regardless of your level of knowledge. And we've got one more question, I believe. In this workshop, 
who are you attending on behalf of? If you're just here as a resident, that's wonderful. If you're representing a government agency, a public agency, a business community member, or nonprofit or other, we'd just like to know um, what hat you're wearing today um, and what your interest is in some of this, because it's always interesting to see who comes to these kinds of meetings and why um, and what their level of interest is or their context for that. All right, more than half of you are here as residents, which is incredible. That's absolutely engagement at its best. We've got 10% from the government sector, almost 10% from the business community, 23% from nonprofits or community-based organizations, which is awesome, and then 7% of others. So we've got a really strong mix of, of people on the phone today, and that's really helpful for us. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, it's really gonna help our speakers tailor their remarks and understand kind of what the context of the questions that you're asking me be coming from. Um, we will be using some other polling technology a little later in this workshop, so stay tuned. Uh, but for now, let's get to our presentation. So the first initiative that we're going to cover today is called Play Everywhere. Um, can you please advance to the next slide? Play Everywhere actually aims to create more options for play, exercise, and social connection in the city. And so Heidi is going to be on tap to tell us more about that effort. And then as a housekeeping note, at the end of her presentation, we'll take a question and then we'll launch some additional polls. Heidi, take it away. Thank you, Erica. Um, good evening, I am Heidi Von Blum. I am a program manager in the planning department. And um, tonight I'll be presenting on um, the Play Everywhere initiative and then later also on um, mobility choices. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to touch on this really quickly. Mike had given a quick overview, but with the slide in the background, it really kind of helps set the frame um, for everybody. Um, we have um, the City of San Diego General Plan, which was adopted in 2008, um, which included a City of Villages strategy that was developed through an intensive three-year public process. It called for redevelopment and infill development in compact, mixed-use, and walkable areas that are located close to transit. It also focused on increasing investments in biking, walking, and transit in locations closest to transit. It also shifted the focus away from the developing development of vacant land and toward reinvestment in existing communities, and also focused on investments in urbanized communities, um, acknowledging that those are critical to the success of the city's future. And then in 2015, the city adopted a landmark climate action plan, which called for significant greenhouse gas emissions reductions related to land use and planning. Um, the key strategies are um, call for locating new housing close to transit, investing in places that result in more people walking, biking, and using transit, and also had a heavy emphasis on equity ensuring equitable distribution of public facilities and services throughout the city. As Mike mentioned, uh, we did engage. Um, the team that we have right now um, has been working on these efforts in front of you, um, the Complete Communities initiatives, um, not just over the past year, but really over the past decade as we began to set our city on a path to success. Many of us on this team have had the opportunity to engage with our citizens and stakeholders for over a decade in the work that culminated in this critical implementation initiative that we are pleased to be presenting to you today. And just a reminder that this is not the end. Again, as Mike mentioned, as the city continues to implement these initiatives, we look forward to continued feedback from the community to use the new funding sources in a way that is best for our residents. Next slide, please. All of the Complete Communities initiatives um, are really focused on addressing inequities that exist in the city today. The Climate Equity Index identifies areas of the city that have very low or low access to opportunity based on 35 indicators selected with input from a stakeholder equity stakeholder working group. Areas with very low and low access to opportunity are known as communities of concern. Inequities from infrastructure investments have been seen um, over the past several decades, resulting in as little as 5% of all development impact fees 
being spent in communities of concern. Complete Communities includes two new funding sources, a Neighborhood Enhancement Fund to fund parks, recreation, and quality of life improvements that Brian will go over when he um, presents the Housing Solutions Program, and an active transportation in lieu fee for biking, walking, and transit investments in areas closest to transit. At least 50% of these new funding sources are required to be expended in communities of concern. Additionally, for the Complete Communities Play Everywhere initiative, that initiative includes a reformed citywide development impact fee to replace existing development fees in various communities with prioritized investments directed toward areas where they are needed the most. Next slide, please. You can skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Mobility and Choices also enables the city to meet state greenhouse gas reduction goals under SB 375 and local goals under the Climate Action Plan. Um, along with housing solutions and play everywhere, all of these initiatives focus on locating land uses close to transit, which is one of the most effective ways to achieve the city's climate goals. Investing in biking, walking, and transit, where they will be used the most, leads to greater overall benefits to the entire city. Next slide. The Complete Communities Play Everywhere, a Parks Master Plan package, is a plan to provide play everywhere for everyone in San Diego. This is a new innovative plan to begin to address inequities in our park system and ensure equitable access to parks for everyone. We recognize that the plan we are presenting represents a change in how we plan for parks. And for that, we are very excited. Excited for the opportunity to begin to address inequities throughout the park system and to plan for new and exciting parks that meet the needs of changing demographics and development trends for everyone in the city. Next slide, please. To give some context to why we are here presenting this plan today, it is helpful to understand the framework under which we plan for parks. When the city adopted the general plan in 2008, the general plan included a recreation element that set forth a broad citywide vision for parks, but recognized the need for more refined citywide park policies specifically to address parks' needs to reflect the city's development trends. This parks master plan is the culmination of that many years long effort to develop this citywide parks policy. While the parks master plan sets forward a master vision for a successful citywide park system, further implementation will be key to the city's success in achieving its vision. Go ahead, please. Oh, go ahead, okay. While the Parks Master Plan sets forward a master vision for a successful citywide park system, further implementation will be key to its success. As we continue to update our community plans, we will be able to identify specific park opportunities and through a public process as we develop general development plans, which are specific park concept plans, followed by construction plans, we will be able to begin to deliver more, more parks to more people much faster than the way that we currently plan for parks. Next slide, please. In addition to the general plan, I did, no, go ahead. Um, this is life um, working in a pandemic. Um, in addition to the general plan identifying, identifying the need for a new parks master plan, we also need this new vision to address inequities in our park system. And we also need it to allow ourselves to plan for new parks and recreational opportunities in areas experiencing the most growth that under our existing system may present significant challenges to providing innovative and flexible approaches to meeting new parks needs. And we need it to advance the city's climate goals. The Climate Action Plan identifies strategic land use planning, specifically by locating new development close to transit as one of the most significant ways that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and support cleaner air for everyone. A new strategy to provide parks for such development is critical, not just for park planning, but for the city's climate goals as well. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan vision includes planning for equitable investments where we know they are needed the most. We also want to ensure easy and safe walking, biking, and transit access to parks for everyone. We want opportunities for everyone to play outside, and we want to be able to comprehensively plan for an interconnected citywide park system, acknowledging that great parks are needed in individual communities, but that individual parks are part of a larger citywide system that everyone should have access to. And finally, we want to see thriving recreational spaces that allow for new recreational experiences. Next slide, please. 
The park's master plan before you today is the culmination of a nearly three-year planning effort. Throughout this time period, the planning department has engaged in various outreach activities, including a citywide statistically valid survey, 13 in-person workshops, online activities, and informational presentations to various advisory bodies. During the public review period earlier this spring, we were fortunate to receive feedback on the plan from over 500 individuals and organizations. Through our outreach efforts, we learned that people not only wanted to see parks without their neighborhood, but also valued open spaces and trails, beaches and shorelines, and various programming within the city's existing facilities. We also saw that residents largely favored upgrades to existing parks, while also identifying the importance to acquire new land for parks. We heard that there were opportunities to add recreational value within existing public spaces, and that residents want to see these investments occur. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan identifies some key recommendations, new equity goals, a reformed and equitable citywide park development impact fee, a new general plan park standard, and a new 10, 20, 30, 40 minute access goal. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan is a plan grounded in equity. Park planning and investments should address systemic and historical inequities experienced by people living in communities of concern. They should also promote equal access to enjoy the many physical and social benefits of public parks. They should prioritize investments that enhance and expand recreation in communities of concern, promote gender equity and equity for people of all abilities and ages, as well as for all modes of travel. Next slide, please. We need to prioritize investments where the greatest needs exist, and we need to invest in a citywide system for all. This includes ensuring that all people in the city, regardless of where they live, have safe and easy access to parks nearby, as well as access to enjoy the great, diverse, and unique park system that San Diego has to offer. For example, we want everyone to enjoy our regional parks and beaches, even if those resources are not located where a particular individual may reside. Next slide, please. The city's current development impact fees are charged to cover the cost of new parks needed to serve new development on residential units throughout the city. But depending on the community that the development occurs within, that fee varies greatly, as low as $600 in some communities to as high as $30,000 in others. We are currently planning for 50 different park system rather than one system to be enjoyed by everyone. This structure also greatly limits the city's ability to deliver parks anywhere in the city. Under state law requirements, we are currently required to spend fees received only for the purpose for which they are collected. We currently collect fees to only be used in the communities in which they are collected. If each community wanted a $1 million park and we collected $999,000 in 50 different communities, under that system, no one is able to get a park because each community is lacking $100,000 to build a park. As we transition to a new citywide fee moving forward, that $990,000 from each community is pooled into one $50 million fund where the city can immediately provide more parks to more people throughout the city. This shift also allows the city to plan for parks as part of a citywide park system and provide a more simplified fee across the city. Next slide, please. As part of this effort, we have prepared a nexus study for a new citywide park fee. This nexus study is based on the city's new proposed standard in its parks master plan, meaning that the funds would no longer be constrained to be used within individual communities and for individual projects. The amount in the Nexus study represents the maximum that the city could legally charge for parks. Remember that the existing fee, remembering that the existing fees vary widely from $600 to $30,000 per unit, moving to a citywide fee would result in fee decreases in some parts of the city and fee increases in other parts of the city. The Nexus study also supports more precisely calculating fees to adequately reflect a project's true park impacts, acknowledging that smaller units tend to house less people resulting in fewer needs, parks needs, and that larger units tend to house more people with greater park needs. This fee scaling is supported in the Nexus study. Next slide, please. The Parks Master Plan also contains a 10, 20, 30, 40 minute access goal. This goal is to achieve a 10 minute walk to a safe and enjoyable nearby park for everyone. In addition, it includes 20 and 30 minute bike and transit access goals to increase mobility options for everyone to access a more diverse range of recreational experiences throughout our city. These time goals are measured by access to a park that can be enjoyed for at least 40 minutes, 
meaning that the park should be safe, activated, and fun to be enjoyed for a good amount of time. Next slide, please. The general plan currently identifies a park standard based solely on park acreage, 2.8 acres for every 1,000 residents. This standard is measured at the community plan level, meaning that some communities that lack space lack the ability to meet that standard and thereby lose on opportunities for new recreational spaces. Additionally, this standard has contributed to the inequities that we have seen in investments in our park system and our communities of concern. Because the funds are constrained to specific communities, communities of concern not only lack investments in their communities, but lack meaningful access to the parks being built outside their communities. Next slide, please. A practical and meaningful standard reflects the variety of recreational experiences within a large diverse city and promotes positive recreational outcomes, such as safe, accessible, and active parks. The plan identifies a new standard to allow for the city to deliver more recreational opportunities sooner for everyone. This new standard is based on recreational value. Size factors into recreational value, but value is recognized for many other factors as well. The plan establishes a standard of 12 points of recreational value per 1,000 residents. The points relate to carrying capacity, recreational opportunities, access, and activation. Recreational value emphasizes the activities and experiences that residents can enjoy, rather than the parkland in a given area. We do anticipate that this standard will increase slightly since we have refined the park scoring matrix to reflect public input we have received to value certain park attributes higher. Next slide, please. We developed the park standard by looking at the current, how the communities in our city currently measure against the existing acreage standard. Um, we started with the general plan 2.8 acre per thousand standard. Um, we then solicited community input and took an inventory of recreational assets. We surveyed our citizens and performed research. Based on the input we received and research we performed, we developed a park scoring matrix with the help of our consultant team. We then set the standard based on four communities that met the previous acreage standard identified in the existing general plan. These communities' recreational amenities were scored, yielding an average recreation value of 12 points per thousand people that is now proposed to be applied citywide. This recreational value represents a range of recreation experiences comparable to the opportunities available to residents in communities that previously achieved the acreage-based standard. I would also like to note that the local park scoring methodology will only be applied to population-based parks and portions of regional parks which serve local populations. Portions of regional parks which are intended to serve the region will not be evaluated using the local park scoring methodology. Next slide, please. Before we look at the case study that is on your screen, I just want to quickly highlight some major changes we have made to the scoring methodology based on public comments and advisory board feedback. The points within the carrying capacity section have been increased to reflect the importance of acreage in the design and value of the park. Under the amenities and recreational opportunities section, point categories were added to capture the value of wetland restoration, native plant restoration, shade within parks, and the mental health benefits that people experience from being in nature. The maximum points allowed in access and connectivity sections were reduced, um, and this was done to shift more of the accumulated points into traditional park amenities. Many of the city's older parks contain few recreational amenities relative to their overall size. This case study illustrates a representative two-acre neighborhood park with a design that offers about 15 points of current recreational value. This value includes points for play areas, proximity to transit, um, and a multi-purpose turf area. Next slide, please. A possible redesign of the space would effectively double its recreational value and serve more people through the incorporation of placemaking elements, a connection to public use, um, and some other amenities such as a skate park and community garden. The case study illustrates opportunities to use existing parkland more efficiently, expanding recreational experience for everyone. Next slide, please. The park's master plan additionally includes a variety of policies to ensure successful implementation of a great city park system. These policies include parks and programming, equity and access, activation, co-benefits, community benefits, arts and culture, next slide, as well as mobility as recreation, conservation, sustainability, and resilience, partnerships, operations and maintenance, regional parks, and funding. Next slide. 
We have been extremely fortunate to have received really valuable feedback on the Parks Master Plan so far and have incorporated many suggested changes into the plan. We have added language to address the need for continual monitoring to ensure that refinements are made as necessary as we implement the plan. We also agree that the mental health benefits that come from being in nature is great and therefore added potential points for areas with access to newly restored habitat areas. And we heard that more points should be given for larger size parks. We also eliminated the max point values for parks. We also clarified that the access standard is intended to ensure a 10 minute walk for every resident and that the 20 and 30 minute bike and transit goals are solely for increasing access to a wider array of recreational resources throughout the city. We have also included policies related to carbon sequestration and multicultural public outreach in the plan. We look forward to the additional feedback that we get tonight, as well as as we continue to move forward, that we can incorporate into the plan um, to make it the most successful plan possible. Next slide. We know that the current standard that we have works for some, but we also know that it does not work for many. And that must be changed. We believe that with successful implementation of this plan, we can achieve that. The Parks Master Plan is intended to be a living document, to be refined continually through feedback and throughout implementation. The plan will be monitored and the city will continue to pursue new land for parks, while also identifying new and exciting opportunities to add incredibly valuable public spaces in smaller spaces. We want to see prioritized investments in areas with the greatest needs, communities of concern, areas lacking adequate parks, and areas experiencing significant growth. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our facilitators again. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really robust presentation and we have gotten a lot of questions uh, into the question box. So we've been working seriously behind the scenes to try and kind of categorize the ones. And some of the ones that we came, that came in um, came in about funding sources. Uh, Lorna Zoukas, Pat Flannery, and a couple others have asked about what are the new funding sources for this and who decides how the money gets spent is one part of the question. And then there's another part of the question around these development impact fees. How were the 95% development impact fees spent? Can you, uh, can you ask, answer those two for us? Yeah, I'm sorry, can you, uh, there were two questions there. So can you repeat the first question for me, please? Yeah, the first one is, what are the new funding sources to pay for this and who decides how the money gets spent? Okay, yeah, so um, the new funding source um, is really a replacement of the existing development impact fees that we collect um, within the community. So it's really intended to replace um, the money that we collect on a community by community basis and pool our resources so that we can more efficiently and effectively deliver parks across the city. And in terms of how do we decide um, how that money gets spent, um, the city currently has um, council policies that relate to the prioritization for all capital improvement projects. Um, and our hope is that we, as we continue to get this vision um, um, approved, um, that the policies in this parks master plan um, make its way into that consideration for the prioritization um, for our citywide um, prioritization process. Awesome, thank you. Um, Jerry Rivero asked, how is the recent Climate Equity Index report part of the planning blueprint? Um, the Climate Equity Index um, specifically called for the inclusion of that within city policies. Um, so we are very excited to have this, um, this ability um, with these initiatives to include the Climate Equity Index in our planning initiatives. Um, so as I mentioned during the presentation, the Climate Equity Index was developed um, with an equity stakeholder working group um, that used 35 indicators to determine the areas with the lowest access to opportunity in our city. And so these three initiatives um, are the first time that we have had the opportunity to include that information within all of those planning initiatives. Perfect. Um, we do understand, and the attendees do as well, that this is an ambitious and innovative plan. You mentioned how, um, how forward-thinking and visionary it is, so thank you for sharing about it. Um, one of our attendees has noted that there are no other cities that have new parks, this standard for new parks that you're proposing. If this moves forward, how will you ensure that it can even be implemented? It's, it's very, um, very innovative. Yeah, so we definitely um, are excited to have a new system um, so that we can begin to provide more parks sooner to everybody throughout the city 
and also to be able to prioritize investments where we know that they're needed the most. Uh, we do understand that with new initiatives, um, there can be some implementation issues that arise, um, which is why, as Mike mentioned at the beginning of his introduction, that um, with all of our initiatives, we continually um, make refinements and continue to solicit public feedback. Um, and we've actually built in policies into this Parks Master Plan to specifically provide for that continual, um, continual refinement and update of the plan to ensure its success. Wonderful, thank you. We are going to take uh, a little break and do some polling next. So um, those of you that are, if we can go to the next slide, perfect. Um, you've been putting your questions in the, in the Q and A box. We really appreciate this. We're gonna introduce a different polling technology than the one that you saw on your screen. Um, this one is going to be actually utilizing cell phones and my team member Hannah is going to give you some instructions about how to do this. So if you have a smartphone with you, we're going to do some real time polling with some um, related questions um, tied to the presentation. Hannah, it's all you. Hannah, can you unmute please? Thank, Thank you, you for the reminder. <laughs> okay, so we're asking you to pull out the cell phone. If you're watching this webinar on your tablet or your computer, grab the cell phone. If you are watching this webinar on your cell phone, then you just will need to open another browser on your smart smartphone. So once you open the smartphone browser, type in the browser sift.ly. You're just going to type six letters and one dot and nothing else. Sift dot l y and then you're going to type the participant code that you see on the screen again if you're typing sift dot l y and nothing happening double check the browser sometimes your uh, www dots mix in so you don't you don't want to have that you just want to have the six letter sift dot l y and that will prompt you to another page to enter your participant code and for those of you who are opening the second browser on your smartphone, multitasking on one device, the code you're going to type is BRJD. And my colleague Melissa, who you don't see on the screen, is monitoring uh, how many people already logged in. So we're going to take just a moment to ensure that everyone is going to sign in, logged in. It sometimes takes a little longer. And then we're going to launch our polling question. If you're having uh, difficulties logging in, uh, use the chat box. And my other colleagues, ah, there are a lot of us today, will try to, tr try to troubleshoot in real time. So I'm switching gears a little bit, switching screens a little bit. Let's wait a moment or two for everyone to sign in. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'm just going to give people a few more seconds here. I've seen quite a few people connected, but I know it can take a minute. So just want to make sure we've got as many people on the line as possible. Yeah, the trick to type sift.ly and nothing else. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch our first question. Um, the first one's just kind of a softball to get you all familiar with it. So if you're not quite connected yet, don't worry. You're not missing anything substantive. Um, so to get, kick us off, we're just curious what your favorite dessert is. And if you're wondering why we're asking this question, it's because we're waiting for the rest of the folks to log in without missing anything. Okay, so the results are rolling in, but half of you are saying that ice cream is your favorite dessert. Ice cream is overwhelmingly the most favorite dessert, almost 48%, followed by, oh, pastries and cookies just did the pie. <laughs> pastries and cookies, 16%, pie, 14%, 8% for going for cakes, 11% are going for other desserts. I wonder what it is. And four of you don't know what's your favorite dessert. Well, perhaps there's always time to find out. <laughs> okay, and, and the winner is ice cream. I almost want to have another polling question, what type of, type of flavors, <laughs> but we're not going to go there. Thanks, Hannah. 
Uh, so this next question is a different type of question. This one's open-ended. Um, so we're hoping that you can share in one word what you like best about San Diego. Climate, beaches, weather, people, ocean, climate, weather, natural beauty, family, diversity, weather, climate, food, ocean, opportunity, lifestyle, open space, weather, the vibe, smiley face, local neighborhood, beach, variety, riding my bike to work, and here comes the word cloud, voila. And the words that are larger, appear larger, climate, weather, that's most of the people, that's what your folks typing. So take a moment and look at this word cloud, and it's still changing a little bit as the rest of you submitting your uh, uh, favorite thing about San Diego. Oh, I see tiny baseball word, and I see some words fr friends. That's great. Zoo. Boating. This is great. Look at all these beautiful words that you type. No, thank you for participating in that. I used to live in San Diego, and you all are making me miss it now. Um, <laughs> so this next question is the similar format to the one we just did, um, but we're hoping that you can share in three words or less, what does the term equity mean to you? And as you folks type in, for those of you who haven't had a chance to log in and you're wondering how do I log in, I missed the instructions. If you look at the screen, on top of the screen, you have sys.ly uh, and the participant code is right on top of your screen. Okay, so what are we typing here? Fairness, fairness for all, opportunity, justice, responsible lifestyle, equal access and opportunity, leveling level playing field, justice, fairness, equality to all, fairness, equal access to opportunity. And I'm just reading this as you folks typing. Sharing the resources, affordable diverse access, equal opportunity, fairness for all, same opportunity for all in all caps, fair justice diversity. Opportunity, equality, diversity. Let's look at the word cloud. Fairness and opportunity you see are very large, in very large funds. And we're still receiving feedback from you folks. We see our word cloud changing. So it's some this work. really helps oh, us help. as we think about um, as we think about the re remaining presentations, and we'll use the term equity, or we'll hear the term equity, and it's helpful to understand what people on the phone think that definition is to them, and, and how that matches, um, or maybe is a little bit different than the perspective that you might hear from others. So it's always nice to do a level set on on terms that we throw around sometimes, but don't always have a common definition for. So it's helpful to see this um, in the context of these conversations. Thank you, Erica. Um, so we have a few more questions for you. Um, these are more directly related to the presentation we just heard um, about parks. Um, so in a survey that San Diego recently did, um, respondents identified small neighborhood projects, things like pocket parks, um, were the type of infrastructure most needed. So we're hoping that you can describe the ability of your local park to meet the needs of your neighborhood. The ability of your local park to meet the needs of your neighborhood. 40% are saying meet some needs, followed by 20% who are saying meets the needs of a few. 18% are saying meets everyone's needs. 17% does not meet needs at all. And 3% don't know. The majority of you saying 42% meet some needs, and the rest is very split between a few needs, everyone needs, and does not meet needs at all. 
Yeah, take a look at the results. So survey respondents also identified um, the desire for parks to be accessible, particularly without a car. So um, do you have a park within a 10 minute walk of your, um, your home, your neighborhood? Okay, results are rolling in and that uh, colors on the circle is shifting. We're seeing a little bit more blue where you're saying uh, there is no park within 10 minutes walk of your home, 30%, and 70% are saying yes, there is a park within a 10 minute walk of your home. Okay, it looks like we're pretty set on numbers here. I don't see the circle moving much. Okay, so 70% are saying yes and 30% are saying no. So how often do you access the park or parks in your neighborhood? How often do you access the park parks in your neighborhood? Wait just a second to see how its answers are popping out. Okay, so 33% are saying weekly. You go to the park weekly. 22% saying day daily. Wow, this is excellent. 20% uh, are saying monthly. 18% are saying rarely. 6% of you are saying never. And uh, tiny 2% saying you go to the park annually. So yeah, like mo almost more than half of, of you saying that you go to the park weekly or daily. Very active community, this is great. Great. Um, so we're also curious if you support redesigning community space to inc include multi-purpose features. So we're gonna, sh I'm gonna toggle screens here and show you um, some pictures of the Piazza in Little Italy. So this is one example of, um, that community space is being redesigned. Okay, you get just a second to look, okay. and then I'll I'll go back to the results so you can see what people think. Let's see the results. One second. Lots of screens going on. <laughs> okay, do you support re redesigning community spaces to include multi purpose features? 75% of you saying yes, 11% of you saying no, and 15% are saying I don't know. So, in, in the example we just showed you, or in other um, redesigns, what would be your top three favorite features? Either of that or that you would like to see included in other projects potentially. Um, one note on this type of question, you do have to hit submit. So once you, once you select your um, choices, please make sure you hit submit so we can see them. And for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with that program or that redesign project, um, think about what you would like if you did see that. Um, kind of replicated in other places, or if you were able to visit, what, what would be important to you as a visitor? Okay, climbing to the top, pedestrian friendly, one of the most important features, uh, followed by dining, followed by farmer's markets, piazza style and design, concerts, other, and shopping is on the very last, the, yeah, the very last. Not a lot of shoppers here. <laughs> yeah, so pedestrian friendly dining farmers market, uh, top three important features. Oh, concerts just beat uh, style and design. So walking, Music dining. Music is making a comeback. <laughs> well, let's see if there's a comeback, yeah. Definitely shopping yeah. has no ch ch choice. <laughs> no chance to come back. I think those results look Pretty set. Yeah. Pedestrian friendly, the top feature, followed by dining, farmers markets, oh, style and design, just big concerts and events. Someone is submitting a last minute entry. 
Okay, I'll take a look at the results. This is fascinating. Thank you guys so much um, for your feedback on these. This is the last question we have on this subject, so we're going to pop back into the presentation. Yes, and please uh, don't, put, don't put away your cell phones too far away because we're going to use this uh, meeting this polling technology one more time tonight. So don't close your browser. Keep your cell phone next to you. Thank you, guys. All right, so now that we have heard about our first initiative, let's hear about the next one. The second initiative is aimed at reducing the level of emissions uh, that are released into the atmosphere and, and making, I think, the air that we all breathe a little cleaner. Um, and it's really connected to the park's proposal, which is promoting a healthier lifestyle, a more active lifestyle. Um, so Heidi's gonna jump back onto the screen and talk to us a little bit more about this initiative. Please keep throwing questions in the chat. We're getting lots of them behind the scenes. You might see me with my mouse moving things around to make sure we try and slot those in at the right time. And we will do our best to get as many of them queued up as possible. So with that, I will turn it back over to Heidi. Thank you. Thank you again, Erica. Um, so I'm also pleased to be presenting Mobility Choices to everyone tonight. Um, Mobility Choices is um, aim is to connect everybody that lives in San Diego or works in San Diego with safe and convenient mobility options that can reliably connect them to jobs, shopping, services, parks, open spaces, and other amenities, um, while also aligning with the city's climate goals so that we can really achieve those greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Next slide, please. The state has passed a series of new legislation related to housing and transportation that the city must adopt, but the city has the ability to adapt state law to its local needs. And this is exactly what is proposed as part of mobility choices. State law broadly requires the city to incentivize the production of more housing located near transit and separately to analyze transportation impacts using a new metric called vehicle miles traveled or VMT to move the city toward a world in which we begin to reduce vehicular travel rather than to accommodate it. However, we need a tailored approach in San Diego. San Diego is a diverse city, both geographically and demographically. Mobility choices is a tailored approach to meet legislative requirements while also prioritizing our communities with the greatest needs, aligning with our climate goals, supporting cleaner air, and investing in walking, biking, and transit infrastructure where they are needed the most. Next slide, please. As the Mobility Choices Program has been developed, we had the following guiding principles in mind. We wanted to see strategic investments in biking, walking, and transit in our city. We wanted equitable investments where the greatest needs exist. We also want to see safe and convenient mobility options for everyone. We want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and support cleaner air. And we want a development process that is aligned with the city's climate goals. Next slide, please. Specifically, why did we develop mobility choices? SB 375 provides for regional targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and SB 743 requires the city to adopt a new metric to analyze transportation impacts. The transportation sector is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing vehicular travel can result in significant greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Specifically, SB 743 requires the city to analyze transportation metrics transportation impact using a vehicle miles traveled or VMT metric rather than a level of service or LOS metric. This new metric directly implements strategy three of the city's climate action plan by measuring transportation in a way that focuses on reducing vehicular travel through strategic walking, biking, and transit investments rather than accommodating additional vehicular traffic by investing in additional roadway capacity. For some background, vehicle miles traveled is the number of trips multiplied by the length of those trips. If we can reduce either the trips taken by replacing them with other modes of travel or the length of trips taken through strategic land use planning, overall citywide vehicle miles traveled is reduced and accordingly, so are greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So how do we implement this new requirement in a way that is best for San Diego? Next slide, please. Overall, what does this all mean for San Diego? And how do we reduce citywide vehicle trips and emissions in the most cost-effective manner? 
This means investing in communities located close to transit where people are the most likely to use walking, biking, and transit facilities. And it means focusing investments where they will yield the greatest equity successes too, by prioritizing investments in communities of concern where we know that greatest needs exist. Next slide, please. This also means creating a safer and healthier city. Better crosswalks, traffic calming features, and fewer cars on the, cars on the road means our city is safer when we move around. We are also a more enjoyable city. Less cars on the road results in safe and enjoyable options for recreation and exercise by foot or by bike. And we increase safe options for everyone to travel and enjoy the many rich and diverse areas of our city. Next slide, please. To tailor the requirements of SB 743 to the city's needs, we began, we began by using SANDAG, our regional planning agency's data, to identify the areas of the city where new development and corresponding investments in walking, biking, and transit would result in the greatest potential to reduce citywide vehicle miles traveled. The city was divided into four mobility zones based on proximity to transit and overall vehicle miles traveled efficiency. The blue areas that you see on this map are in relatively VMT efficient areas, and the yellow areas are in less efficient areas. Mobility Zone 1 consists of the downtown community planning area, which is the city's most efficient area with the least amount of car travel occurring. In Mobility Zone 1, no additional regulations would be required. Next slide, please. Mobility Zone 2 consists of the city's transit priority areas, those located within a half a mile of high quality transit. Our Climate Action Plan calls for most new development to occur within these areas and recognizes the extremely high value for investments in active transportation in these areas as well. In Mobility Zone 2, on-site measures would be required, similar to the TPA parking regulations that were approved about a year ago. Mobility Zone 3 consists of the city's community planning areas that show a 15% reduction from the re regional average of vehicle travel. In these areas, similar to Mobility Zone 2, on-site measures would be required. The measures that would be required would be selected from a list of measures that would reduce vehicle travel by providing active transportation improvements that enhance the bicycle, um, bicycle and pedestrian experience. And Mobility Zone 4 consists of all areas that are not located in Zones 1, 2, or 3. Rather than requiring investments in these areas, which can be extremely costly, and do not result in significant VMT reductions, a new active transportation in lieu fee would be required to be paid. This fee would then be used by the city to pay for improvements in zones one, two, and three, the blue areas on that map, where the greatest VMT reduction potential exists. The types of measures we can expect to see in mobility zones two and three are the types of measures that encourage people to walk, bike, and use transit, and that enhance quality of life. These measures support safer roads for walkers and bikers and provide additional space for recreation. We have seen many of these types of amenities already included in development located near transit, and these regulations will ensure that these investments continue to occur. Examples of measures include, sorry, examples of measures include pedestrian scale lighting, high visibility crosswalks, um, pedestrian resting areas, carpool or car vehicle, um, carpool vehicle parking and electric um, bicycle charging stations. Um, these measures were developed with feedback that we received during the public outreach efforts. Next slide, please. As mentioned, an active transportation in Lucy would apply to new development in mobility zone four, those yellow areas that were on the map. This funding would be used to fund improvements where they would be used by the most people, thereby giving the city its greatest return on investment. Active transportation investments that are located in areas with higher populations and activity inherently are more effective. For example, a mile of bike lane in a more heavily populated area will serve much more people than if that same mile of land, bike lane is located in an area with less people. Because more people will use that mile of bike lane, that one mile in mobility zones one, two, or three will result in much greater vehicle miles traveled reductions and help us achieve our climate goals sooner at an overall lower cost. Next slide. Mobility zones one, two, and three are most VMT efficient areas, almost perfectly aligned with the city's communities of concern. Therefore, investments in communities of concern alone are investments that are good for overall citywide vehicle miles traveled reductions. The city's climate equity index identifies areas with low and low access to opportunity. 
the city's communities of concern. And these are the areas that we believe deserve prioritized investment. To begin to address inequities that exist within the cities of communities of concern, under this initiative, at least 50% of all funds from the program would be required to be spent solely within communities of concern. This is a plan to invest the city's resources in the most efficient way toward achieving the city's climate goals. A dollar invested in areas closest to high quality transit yields up to four times the amount of greenhouse gas emissions reductions than would be achieved if that same dollar were invested in mobility zone four. And um, this ends the presentation for mobility choices and I'm gonna turn it back over to our facilitators for some questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, well, we do have quite a few questions. Let me pull them up for you. Um, let's start with just um, some general questions about what we're seeing a lot is the fees, right? So the city is collecting fees from various mobility zones, but they're spending them in other parts of the city. Why is that? Can you talk a little bit about that, specifically mobility zone four? We've gotten some questions about why the fees collected in mobility zone four are spent elsewhere in the city. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so the um, so thank you for that question. That's a question that we've heard a lot throughout the process um, uh, because at first it can seem a little bit counterintuitive. Um, the answer is that the development and mobility zones four um, can generate um, larger impacts related to vehicular travel. And rather than requiring development in those areas to invest in facilities that would be used by the least amount of people, what we want to do is provide an overall citywide benefit where everyone in the city benefits. And by this, I mean that if we take the dollars that we collect in Mobility Zone 4 and prioritize and spend those investments in our areas where more people live, located in areas closer to transit, with land uses that are located close together as well, we can get our greatest return on that dollar investment. So in terms of meeting our climate goals, taking the money um, generated in one zone of the city and using it in areas where we can see our greatest return on investment gets the city to achieving its climate goals in the most efficient and quick way possible. Got it. That makes sense. This is complemented. Uh, this is a complimentary question, but I didn't want to separate the two and out of interest of, of, the, of the comments that we're getting. We've got another complimentary comment that asks, why is Mobility Zone 4 burdened with a fee and the other Mobility Zones not burdened with a fee? And I think you might have answered it, but if there's anything additional related to that, I just wanted to be to honor the spirit of that question. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really um, the same um, answer that I provided for the other question, um, but because I, I, we really do understand that at first it can seem very counterintuitive. Um, really, vehicle miles traveled is a citywide issue. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are a global issue. Um, and when we look at how to achieve those goals, um, we have to look at our land uses throughout the city, and we have to look at where our investments make the most sense to essentially get our greatest um, bang for our buck. Thanks for that. Um, hi there. All right, so we have another question about communities of concern. So there are uh, a number of things that you've mentioned in your presentation about that, and some of the attendees are asking where they can get more information about where which neighborhoods fall as a community of concern, um, and also the maps of the mobility zones. So there's clarity on, on those two items. Um, and then yeah. also if you can talk about how those communities of concern were selected, and if somebody's not in it, you know, how do they, how do they either um, advocate for their community or hear about, you know, all the, all the designations that have already been made? Yeah, so the communities of concern were identified um, in the citywide climate equity index. Um, that can easily be accessed on the city's sustainability website, but the maps showing the specific areas of the communities of concern are also located um, on our website as well, on the planning department's website for each of, um, each of these initiatives. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we're gonna jump into our mobility polls very quickly, and there will be more time at the end of this to go into additional questions on all of the presentations. 
A lot of the other questions we're getting are related to some of the other topics and we want to make sure that they, you have all the information before we ask those questions. And so um, we're going to jump into instant polling before we uh, talk about our last initiative. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Erica. Okay, so the same process for those of you who uh, have your browser already open. The questions will start rolling in. If you are uh, logging in again to the um, instant polling, type this.ly and enter participant code, D-R-J-D. Mm. And, uh, and you yeah. see the results. Um, so our next question we'll put up here as people are, are getting back in. What is your primary mode of transportation? What is your primary mode of transportation? Those of you who have already participated, you see that circle with lots of orange color indicating that car is the primary mode of transportation. 81% of you are saying that. Then followed by uh, walking, 8%, followed by biking, 6%. 4% are saying transit is the primary mode of transportation. Uh, other 2% and ride share. No one actually said ride share. No one selected that. Okay, so car, car is still at 81%. Take a look at the results. I'm just going to let this up for a few more seconds so that I know people are probably still joining. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're still joining, again, on the top of the slide, you see the address to type in your browser and the participant code. It's very helpful to have it there. Okay, let's see if uh, results will shift a little bit if some of you are still answering this question. So far we have 80% of you said the, ca the car is the primary mode of transportation, followed by walking, biking, public transit, other. Go ahead and advance this. How often do you use the bike lanes and bike paths in your neighborhood? How often do you use the bike lanes and paths in your neighborhood? Oh, shit. Okay, well, half of you are saying uh, never. What is it? 46% actually now it's going down. 45% uh, are saying never. 18% are saying weekly. 16% are saying rarely. 14% are saying daily. And about 8% are saying annually. So 44% never use the bike lanes and paths pass in your neighborhood. And 18% are using weekly. That's a good number, 18%. Okay, take a look at the results on the screen. So in a, in a survey conducted by the city, um, respondents identified safety and comfort as their most important factor when um, determining if they would use bike paths and walking paths. Um, so we're curious what the top three improvements um, would encourage you to use your bike paths more often. And again, um, make sure that you hit submit at the bottom of your screen once you select your option so that they are visible. Okay, it looks like safe and comfortable bike path is uh, number one. Improvements that would encourage you to bike more, followed by bike path goes to my des destination, and you don't see the destination on the screen. It's cut out a little bit, followed by slower traffic. Your top three improvements, safe, comfortable bike path, bike path that goes to your destination, slower traffic. This is great. Thank you for sharing this uh, feedback. It's very interesting. Very interesting to see what's coming out out of this group. And this is going to be our last meeting shift polling question. We're going to use a different uh, software for our third round of polling. 
So if you're still answering the questions, go ahead. If not, take a uh, look at the results and you can close your uh, browser on your cell phone for the meeting too. Thank you all. So we will keep going and in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. And just so you know, uh, the polls are actually a great chance for us to see the questions in the chat and start moving things around to make sure that we um, manage and, and kind of put the things at the top that we're seeing themes for. Um, so if you wonder what we're doing in between questions, it, it's really hearing from you all. We usually get a flurry of questions right at the end of every presentation and we wanna make sure we ask the right ones and that we have uh, those queued up for you. So we're, we're honoring your time and your intent. So um, we're at the point where we're gonna learn about the third initiative, and I think you see Brian on your screen now. Um, this initiative is really about housing. It's called Housing Solutions. It's about providing access to a, a number of housing options and neighborhood amenities. And so Brian Jonefish, he's a program manager, as I mentioned, with the city. He's gonna talk about this initiative. Um, and in the meantime, please keep sending in your questions and we'll be working seriously behind the scenes. Go ahead, Brian. All right, thank you. If you could move to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Okay, so the Housing Solutions Program is a new opt-in affordable housing incentive program. It is another tool to implement the general plan City of Villages strategy, the Climate Action Plan, and the recently adopted housing element. It takes a comprehensive approach which encourages a diverse range of housing in near transit and includes the preservation of any existing affordable rents as well as anti-displacement measures and anti-gentrification measures, along with neighborhood serving amenities and equity components. Next slide, please. When discussing the Housing Solutions Program, it is important that we first start by understanding the current housing crisis that we are in. This table show, shows the city's share of the regional housing targets in which we are in the final year of the current 10-year cycle. As you can see, we have produced less than 50% of our housing needs. The numbers are especially bad in the very low, low and moderate income categories. The problem is even more compounded by the fact that we are about to begin a new regional housing cycle next year, where the city now has the ambitious responsibility to not only plan for, but to also facilitate the production of over 108,000 new housing units over the next eight years. What this means is that we will have to triple our current annual housing production numbers in order to meet the new targets and, and also to adequately address our housing needs. Next slide, please. Now that we have these new housing targets and we know from past trends that our annual housing production numbers fall well short of meeting our housing needs, we need to take steps to do more to facilitate the production of housing. The Complete Communities Housing Solutions proposal is one additional tool that will help us do that through a series of incentives and requirements. I will briefly cover what the program offers and then provide details on the program requirements. This is an optional, opt-in affordable housing incentive program, which offers project applicants an expedited permitting process, which is easier to navigate through so that these much needed housing units can be delivered in a much more timely manner. It also provides for a density calculation that is based on square footage through an allowable floor area ratio rather than through dwelling units per acre. This allows for a greater diversity of unit sizes and types, including more affordable and smaller size units. The height is also governed by the project's allowable floor area ratio. This program also includes allowances for incentives and waivers, which is similar to the current affordable housing density bonus programs, both at the city and the state. And finally, the program provides for the right sizing of development impact fees, meaning that they are based on unit size rather than on a one size fits all approach, which actually discourages smaller size and more affordable units. Two additional measures to further incentivize affordable housing units came about through the public input process as this program was being developed. These include the waiver of development impact fees for both covenant restricted affordable units and micro units, those which are less than 500 square feet. 
Overall, the incentives included in this program are designed to build more certainty into the approval process, create more flexibility for what structures can fit onto various parcels, and make more affordable, make it more affordable to build smaller units. Next slide, please. The geographic areas that are eligible for this opt-in program align with those areas which are most VMT efficient from the Mobility Choices Program, those which are located within a transit priority area, and in this case, those which are in zones which allow for multifamily housing. It is scaled so that greater densities are allowed where the VMT is more efficient. Therefore, projects located downtown where the VMT is most efficient would be allowed in unlimited density. Projects located in Tier 2, where the VMT is very efficient, would be allowed an 8.0 floor area ratio. And projects located in Tier 3, where the VMT is still efficient, would be allowed a 4.0 floor area ratio. Also, I want to mention that projects which are located within the coastal height overlay zone would be limited to a 3.0 floor area ratio, as that area is governed by a 30-foot height limit that will not change through this program. I also need to mention that sites within a designated historical district are not eligible to participate in this program. Next slide, please. Now, as for the requirements that projects must meet in order to be eligible to opt into this incentive program, there are quite a few, which I will now go over. As just described, projects must be located in transit priority areas and must also be zoned to allow multifamily dwelling units. The project must also build a certain percentage of covenant restricted affordable housing units. The requirement would be at least 10% of the units would have to be up to 60% of the area median income, plus an additional 10% of the units up to 120% of the area median income. This is that moderate income category of covenant restricted affordable units that you may recall from the table on my second slide where the housing production numbers are especially low to the point where they don't even show up on the bar graph. This program would help address that issue. This program also includes a requirement to preserve affordable rents in those cases where there are any existing units already on a project site. And I will get into more detail on this in just a moment. Also, there is a neighborhood amenity requirement that I will also provide more detail on in just a couple of minutes. And finally, this program also includes design requirements, such as widening sidewalks to promote walkability, as well as other setback requirements. One in particular, which was added after hearing from the community, requires a transition plane in which development would be required to step back from any adjacent property having a single family zone, in addition to a limit on the height increase to either three stories or 33 feet above the zone maximum. These requirements are far stricter than the existing density bonus program in which an applicant can use either an incentive or a waiver to exceed the height limit right up to the property line. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, addressing housing affordability is the primary reason for this new opt-in program. And I already mentioned the requirement for 10% of the units up to 60% AMI plus another 10% up to 120% AMI. I also want to mention another area in which this program addresses, and that is preserving the affordability of any existing naturally occurring affordable unit housing units, which may exist on a project site. For all naturally occurring affordable housing units, this program requires going back seven years prior to the application process to identify whether any existing units may have been occupied by persons or families of very low income low income or moderate income. The San Diego Housing Commission recently re released a report that many of these units will be permanently lost if action is not taken. Therefore, this program includes requirements to replace any existing naturally occurring affordable units with brand new deed restricted affordable units with a 55 year affordable affordability covenant restriction on them. This will preserve the affordability of those units that could otherwise be lost to redevelopment or lost when renovation occurs in which the units are often converted to high priced rentals. This program also provides an additional preservation tool to preserve the affordability of those units. Next slide, please. 
Following up on that topic, this program also includes requirements to provide for relocation assistance for any resident living in those naturally occurring affordable units that would be temporarily displaced by the construction process, as well as the right of first refusal for those residents to live in the new covenant restricted affordable units once they are completed. Also, for the first time in the municipal code, the city is introducing priority preference for those residents living within a community of concern who are living within a half mile of the project at the time of application. They would be offered priority preference for the first 60% of those new affordable units. This addresses concerns regarding gentrification within the communities of concern, as at a minimum, 60% of the new affordable units would be offered to residents already living within those communities. Next slide, please. One of the highlights of the Complete Communities Housing Solutions Program is that it isn't solely focused on housing. It also includes a neighborhood amenity requirement. It is important to provide more opportunities for children to play close to home, especially in low-income communities. This would be met in one of two ways, either by paying a fee, which we are calling the Neighborhood Enhancement Fee, or by constructing on-site recreational improvements in a linear park setting. This program would also require a minimum of two community design workshops to ensure that community that the community is at the table and included in the discussion as these improvements are being designed. It is also important to point out that the neighborhood enhancement fee is a new fee in addition to the development impact fees that a project must pay. This is a separate fund that is being established as part of this particular program. Next slide, please. One common theme that we have heard from our outreach process that applies to all three of the initiatives we are presenting tonight is the importance of equity. Therefore, 50% of the neighborhood enhancement fee collected will go towards improvements within communities of concern. Many times these are the communities that are not currently seeing the investments and not benefiting from the activities occurring all across the city. When talking about neighborhood amenities, it is important to point out that the types of amenities that we are talking about through this program are more of the neighborhood scale, neighborhood serving improvements, which implement the same policy guidance documents that we have mentioned here tonight, including the Climate Action Plan and the Parks Master Plan. The focus is on the pedestrian environment, things that encourage people to get out, to walk, to bicycle, to play, and to enjoy the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Over the past year, the planning department has conducted an extensive outreach effort for the housing solutions and mobility choices programs, which included 11 formal public hearings and workshops, including the EIR scoping meeting, presentations to the land use and housing committee, the planning commission, the public safety and livable neighborhoods committee, the mobility board and the community planners committee, as well as countless and diverse range of interest groups and a transit and tacos pop-up event in addition to an extended 90-day public comment period and the launch of several online engagement efforts. Next slide, please. This summary is so extensive that it actually takes up two whole slides. Also, to account for new circumstances due to COVID-19 and to continue to provide an avenue for the public to provide feedback on these initiatives, Initiative-specific informational web pages and online surveys were developed and posted for Play Everywhere, Housing Solutions, and Mobility Choices. These were available from May 1st to June 15th. I'm going to wrap up by saying that we have heard a great deal of input over the past year and a half, which has led to many of the changes to the Housing Solutions program that we have made to date. And while not everyone may agree on the same path forward to address the housing affordability crisis or existing inequities, the input we have received has been extremely valuable. And it doesn't stop here tonight. We are continuing to contemplate additional modifications based on feedback received and expect to release an updated version of the proposal in advance of any city council hearing. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to leave you with the web pages to each of the three proposals which we covered here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, so we do have a few questions coming in, more than a few, and uh, we're going to collate them and bring them to forum. So just in terms of the, the process, we're going to ask Brian a couple questions specifically about housing. 
then we're going to do a quick poll, and then we're going to bring back all of the panelists to ask and answer questions related to any or all of the things you have heard tonight. Um, so we'll start right in with Brian and housing. So this is a paraphrased question from a lot of comments and questions that we got. Um, San Diego residents, as you know, they take a lot of pride in their neighborhoods, and uh, some of our attendees are wondering how the housing initiative you're proposing is going to protect the look and feel of existing neighborhoods, and they want to know how you're going to make sure that their homes remain a quote-unquote sanctuary that isn't disturbed by play everywhere. So it's a little bit of a combo about housing, but also about the play everywhere initiative. Can you speak to that and speak to how um, these uh, potentially the housing and the parks discussion might um, might play a role in those things? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned during the presentation was the uh, addition of some design regulations and requirements as we worked with the public throughout this process. Um, and really, um, the program, you know, includes these supplemental design regulations um, to address how it really fits into the neighborhoods um, and tries to make them more pedestrian friendly and accessible with wide sidewalks, no gates or fencing. Um, and then we added in those additional um, regulations that I mentioned that um, if they're built uh, in, in, on a lot that's adjacent to a single family home, um, they're limited to, limited to a height increase of, of no more than three stories or 33 feet. And they have to include uh, a transition plane, which is a series of step backs um, from that property line. Um, we also have some additional um, regulations in there that if uh, a structure is proposed to be taller than 95 feet, um, they must host a community design charrette uh, for community members to be involved in the discussion uh, about the design and provide feedback. Um, also, um, if a project uh, includes the um, linear public linear park that I talked about as the uh, neighborhood amenity, the project must also hold a design charrette to present the design concept and receive uh, feedback from community members. In fact, two design charrettes in that case. So. There are opportunities uh, moving forward to continue to have uh, in community involvement. And like I said, we also built some, some strict design requirements into the program. Thanks so much. We got a lot of questions about that. Um, we've also gotten some comments from the group about how the, and this is similar to the other proposals, there are questions around funding, um, how the neighborhood enhancement funds will be spent. Um, I know the proposal you mentioned calls for 50% of the neighborhood enhancement funds to be spent in communities of concern. Can you talk about that and what uh, about the other 50%? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way the program has been set up is that 50%, as I mentioned, um, uh, would be committed to um, being spent in communities of concern. And then there's an additional, additional 50% would be spent in the community where the project actually occurs. Um, and, the, and as I mentioned um, through the um, amenities, neighborhood amenities discussion, um, really the focus is on things that are of the neighborhood scale, neighborhood serving uh, amenities, whether they're recreation or mobility, um, on bicycle projects, park projects, um, those types of improvements. It's not, we're not talking about these large scale uh, road pro uh, roadway projects. We're talking about ones that really serve the community and the neighborhood and try to integrate the project, the new project into the existing fabric of the neighborhood. So that's really the focus of this money. Um, we have a great example out in the um, Broadway Heights neighborhood of Encanto um, over the last few years where the city planning department worked closely with the Broadway Heights Community Council and um, um, other uh, neighborhood leaders and organizations in a nonprofit called the Urban Corps of San Diego. And we um, held some quite a few community workshops and what they wanted to create was a first of its kind. It was called the Martin Luther King um, Promenade Street in which it's a, it's a sort of outdoor cultural museum with kiosks and all sorts of educational activities. Um, we're reclaiming underutilized public right of, rights of way. So it was just a, a street, a uh, small street in a neighborhood where we're able to create this like outdoor museum type setting where the community can come and have gatherings. Um, you can bring your smartphone and there are QRC codes. You can go to, all, you can actually listen to the um, I have a dream speech as you're going through, you can listen to, you can pull up websites um, on these civil rights leaders. Um, so it's a very great educational experience. School groups come out there and learn. It's something that the, that community really wanted. And quite frankly, it wasn't that expensive to build. It was all built for less than $500,000. So these are the more neighborhood scale 
small um, types of improvements. I encourage everyone to go out there and take a look um, at that project. Those are the types of you know projects that we're hearing from from the communities that sometimes they're they're small in scale, but they're they're something that's really important to the community. Great, thank you. So there will be an opportunity to ask and answer more questions about housing. Um, but briefly, we're going to jump to another attendee survey about housing. We have reached the end of the three presentations, and this will be our last poll for the evening. And we're going to switch back to our original polling option, which is through the computer, so you don't need your cell phones for this one. You're going to see some questions appearing on your screen in just a second, and we're going to ask you uh, four questions, and then we'll jump into the larger Q&A. All right, so to meet the housing demand and the state housing production goals, uh, that Brian talked about. What do you think the city needs to do in terms of housing production? Do you think the city needs to double, triple, or quadruple its housing production? What are your thoughts? We know what's being proposed, but what do you think is needed? All right, we should be almost done with this poll. And the survey says that it's actually pretty evenly split there. It looks like uh, the vast majority think you need to double it, uh, then followed by triple and then quadruple. But it is relatively close. And it's interesting, I think, different perspectives, uh, different experiences, um, and obviously different answers. All right, let's go to the next question. So this is related to the conversation that we hear over and over again about the affordability of housing. And, you know, it's a very subjective question we know. Do you think that your average monthly rent or mortgage is too expensive, about right, or very affordable? So think Goldilocks syndrome, too much, just right, not quite uh, as much as you would expect to pay. How do you feel? All right, survey says, oh, more than half of you think it's too expensive, but the remainder of you think it's about, well, 43% think it's about right, and 8% of you think it's very affordable. And again, this is a subjective question, we know that, but it's always nice to understand based on who's on the call, kind of what their perceptions are around this and whether or not surveys that we've taken uh, in other, in other uh, scenarios have matched up and uh, in line with that. Um, and for our next question, Do you think that residents with a range of incomes, ages and abilities have the ability to live in your neighborhood? Do you think it's accessible to them um, either for any number of reasons? Um, um, as we think about equity, as we think about inclusion, as we think about this vision of San Diego being um, really a place for, for all residents, do you feel like that's what it's like in your neighborhood? Yes, no, or you're not sure? And the answer is, yeah, a lot of you think yes, but more of you think no. Um, and some of you don't know, and that's okay too. Again, this is interesting for us to understand kind of perspective and, and subjectivity around these things. It's all about your own lived experience. Um, everyone has a different perspective as a resident, and it's valuable, I think, for the city to understand the range of perspective as it relates to housing and um, access um, and certainly equity. And I think we have one last question on this one before we go to our general Q&A. All right, how important is it to you 
for the city to prioritize investments in communities of concern. We have heard about it uh, over a couple different of the initiatives and you've all spoken uh, in your questions about communities of concern and how they're selected. Do you think it's important for the city to invest in those? Very important, somewhat important, neutral or not important at all? We're almost done with that poll. It looks like most of you think it's very important or somewhat important, about more than more than 70%. Um, actually, almost 80 believe that it is incredibly important or somewhat, and others don't care, it's neutral to you, and 4% of you think it's not important for the city to prioritize those investments. Um, again, helpful to see the context of those on the phone, uh, your residents, your fellow um, you know, San Diego um, neighbors, uh, all feel differently about these kinds of things. And I think that's, uh, that speaks to the complexity of this as you look at local agencies trying to balance the needs and the wants of the community and the vision. Um, it is not an easy, an easy decision-making process um, and policy-making process. And so I think that um, your, your um, poll results, survey results definitely speak to that um, discrepancy in, in opinion and approach. So we really appreciate you sharing those insights with us. And let us jump right in to our Q&A. So I'm going to ask all of our panelists um, to jump back on the camera and I will ask the, some of the questions that we have uh, funneled up. Um, we're focusing primarily on those that we saw lots of questions about. Um, we will be talking about uh, all three initiatives and then some general questions. I see Heidi's back on the camera. Great. Um, and we'll um, ask every panelist um, kind of we'll just kind of pepper back and forth by initiative and Heidi since you're the first one to jump on I can start with a question for you um, let's see as it relates to parks we got a question about how will park needs be assessed and addressed in older urban communities where parkland deficits are extreme but it is not a designated community of concern can you speak to that Oh, you got to go off mute, though. Sorry. It's a good technical reminder for everyone. Thank, thank your you. cameras are on, thank but you. your mutes are off. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, that's a really great question. Um, and one of the reasons why we're really excited to be proposing um, this new standard in the Parks Master Plan, um, because it really gives those urban communities, even the areas um, outside of the communities of concern, the opportunity um, to identify some really cool um, park opportunities uh, where we currently have been constrained in planning for those new park opportunities um, when we're only looking to add additional acreage. Um, so one of the most immediate ways that communities um, in more dense urban environments can benefit from the um, Play Everywhere initiative um, is by having that new standard available to identify um, unique, innovative, and flexible new recreational opportunities for everybody um, within those areas um, to really have that chance to develop um, projects, even um, where that um, new land may not be available. So um, the city's always looking for new land, um, for new park opportunities, um, but rather than waiting around for years and years and years that it may take um, to um, have that available land um, come um, into reality, um, we now with this initiative will have the ability um, to plan for other unique spaces um, that really provide great value. So that example um, in that polling question of the Little Italy Piazza is a great example of small spaces that have provided really great recreational opportunities, which we saw a lot of you guys um, really um, resonated positively with. Thank you. That was, um, that was a question from Deborah and a couple others. All right, we will move to another housing question. We'll go to Brian and I'll pop back over to Heidi and Mike. Um, Brian, this is a question about density and housing. Um, John's asking if it makes sense to encourage higher density housing or other development near bus routes, which are flexible and often inefficient. Thoughts about that? It speaks to both mobility, I guess, and, and uh, housing. Can you speak to that or maybe in, in tag team with, uh, with Heidi? Sure. Um, so the, the, um, 
one of the requirements of this program, as I mentioned, is that it, it has to be located in um, a transit priority area. So it's not what we're talking about by the definition of transit priority area is it must it either has a, a, um, a trolley line or a rail line or um, a, a, a series more than one multiple um, high frequency bus lines. So it's not we're not just talking about a single bus stop with a line that, that goes every you know, once every 30 minutes. These are these are lines that um, run every uh, within every 15 minutes or less um, um, during peak commute periods. And also, it's multiple lines. So we're talking about more than one line here. So these are the locations where we have made significant investments in transit. And so these are the areas where we are, are making investments now in infrastructure, directing them towards these areas, and also um, in housing. These are the areas that are. Um, ready for additional housing um, where it makes sense that people we can provide people with options to whether to take transit to walk to bicycle to access um, parks and other amenities um, the, these are the areas where we are focusing our growth and this is in line with our climate action plan and our city of villages strategy great thank you um i'm gonna jump to a question here from mike Oh, go ahead, Heidi. Do you want to you want to add something? Yeah, I just was going to add to that. Um, you know, for the Mobility Choices Program, um, that's one of the reasons why we really want to have those focused investments in those areas um, to support the new um, development that is coming um, in the areas that already have in tra have transit, but using that new funding source um, to really add to that um, to that walkability, bikeability, and and the ease of transit use as well. Thanks for that additional info. All right, so this is a question for Mike, and it's actually related to this, um, the presentation in general. We've gotten a, a few questions from attendees about all three presentations and how they fit together. And one specific question is that we got a couple times is if these, these initiatives are, are packaged together or separate. So is housing solutions intrinsically tied to mobility, intrinsically tied to parks, are these all separate? What, what is that process? I think that's a really good question. So the initiatives are all sharing some of the same foundations and the way that that uh, that the city is approaching the planning of the initiative. So they're integrated together. They should share common features such as the uh, really the prioritization of our funding and our resources in the areas of the city that need them the most. The equity components are shared. We think that they will all function better together because, for example, with mobility choices, we're seeing a uh, accelerated and heightened level of investment in the areas of the city that, as Brian showed you, that we are planning for additional housing opportunities. So we think the initiatives will definitely function better together, but they are uh, separate initiatives and separate packages of regulations and policies. And we have treated them somewhat separately in terms of um, our website, as you can see today, we've treated them separately, but they, they really do share a lot of commonalities. And then one other Great, thing thank you. is, is they, they all, as I mentioned before, they share that they are implementing measures of the Climate Action Plan and the General Plan City of Villages strategy. So they are not new, um, brand new, completely new uh, visions. They fall within the existing visions that the city has had for many, many years in the general plan and climate action plan. Great, that helps a lot. Um, okay, let's jump to mobility. And Heidi's gonna get the uh, line share these questions because you had two presentations. Um, Angela, Sally, a couple others, uh, quite a few others, mentioned that they don't have many bike lanes uh, or if any near their home and transit's not close, doesn't take them where they need to go. They're asking if new transit and bike lanes can be added to their area and what that process might be. Yeah, so um, if they are within the zones one, two, and three, um, those are areas um, that really are um, having those targeted investments um, for the new walking, biking, and transit infrastructure. Um, but if you're living in an area that's currently in that yellow zone that was in the map in mobility zone four and you're not located close to transit, um, one of the things that we um, work with our regional planning agency on um, is expanding the areas that are close to transit. So um, the last question is kind of focused on, you know, um, what's the proper sequence to to invest? You know, do we do we put the 
the housing there first, um, and then the infrastructure, the infrastructure, you know, at the same time. So um, one of the the benefits of looking at, a, at everything is at a regional level is that um, not only do we want to see investments in the areas where it currently makes sense, but we also want to continue to work um, through comprehensive planning to identify how do we get transit to more areas so that more areas in the yellow that you saw on this map can become blue areas. Ideally, we would love to see our whole city um, as a, as a, as a, all of the communities within our city as having that high efficiency um, with lower car travel. Um, so as we continue to plan with our partners and with our other agency partners, um, we really hope to decrease the yellow areas on that map and increase the blue areas so that we can prioritize investments in more areas to benefit the most people in the city. Great, thank you. Um, this is a little bit of a, a tough question, but we're gonna ask it the way it was asked and uh, asked on the on the on the line um, again to honor the spirit of the question and the way it was asked. It's kind of a housing and mobility related, and it's going to be I think mostly for Brian, but maybe also for Heidi. Uh, the comment is that it's clear that the vast majority of the people on the webinar um, and on this in this meeting um, use their personal cars as the primary mode of transportation, but the developments that are being proposed at the housing level um, don't include sufficient parking for people visiting, living, and working there. So the question is why the city or, or we're proposing building unusable living models first and that transportation uh, is coming second. Talk about that. I, I can start that off um, and then Brian can add to it. Um, so I talked about that in the response to the last question as well is um, really how do we strategically plan um, for a livable and safe and enjoyable city for everybody? Um, so I think what the question might have been related to is that we um, did um, have parking regulations last year um, related to um, areas um, close to transit. Um, but separately, um, what this initiative focuses on is providing those investments um, to those areas so that um, everybody, all the new developments that come online have that opportunity to get out of their car and walk and bike um, and use transit and for our city as a whole to experience the benefits that come from that happening. Yeah, right, and if I could just add to that also, I mentioned I already mentioned uh, a lot of the design requirements and the focus of um, of the amenities as well. Um, what we're talking about with our neighborhood amenities through the housing solutions program is, you know, recreational amenities, but also walking paths, bicycle lanes, trails, um, things that really, again, prom public promenades and plazas and where local residents can exercise, spend time outdoors in their neighborhood, get people out um, again. Also, um, as part of this program, because it's an opt-in uh, program, uh, it can also be used for repairs uh, to sidewalks, additional shade trees, uh, drinking fountains, bicycle parking, outdoor exercise stations, um, things that really, again, are focused on creating that nice, pleasant, safe, walking environment. Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, we're gonna jump to a parks question and then um, we will ask one last one before we uh, open it up to the panelists. Um, we're seeing that uh, quite a few actually, uh, Tom and a number of others mentioned that there's parts of the city, and this is parks related, Mid City, El Cerrito, Rolando, College Area have very few if no parks. Um, why are they not listed as, as parks poor on the map? Yeah, so um, with respect to um, the communities of concern, that's again based on the citywide equity index. Um, and then in terms of identifying areas um, with the greatest needs, um, that's part of what I had talked about the initial planning framework as we move forward. Um, we we know that the adoption of a parks master plan is is not the end of our, our path to a successful city park system. We know that we need to continue to implement that. One of the ways that we do that is through our comprehensive community planning. So when we go into communities like the commenter mentioned, um, we really have that opportunity to more closely look at the um, parks that exist in the neighborhood and more specifically identify um, the deficiencies of parks that are in that neighborhood 
And with the new park standard, we have the ability to plan for new park spaces that we may not have been able to do in our prior community planning update efforts. Um, so that's one of the really exciting parts of that plan is it really gives us that ability um, to successfully implement it when we move into our community plan updates. We also all know that community plan updates are a long process and not all communities receive you know, community plan updates um, on a regular basis. Um, and so we do have other ways to implement the parks master plan vision. One of them is through the development of general development plans um, where specific ideas um, can be curated um, within specific communities. Um, those are developed through a public process. Um, and when we have those, um, it also gives us the opportunity for really unique types of parks that serve um, an area with a great need for parks. Um, it gives us the opportunity to be more competitive as we pursue grant opportunities as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'll round out the last question. I'll hand it over to Mike. He started us off and I'll have him end us off. And it's um, something you might have touched on during the presentations, but we got a lot of questions in the chat about it, so I wanted to honor those. Um, there is a lot of comment about the being, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're doing so many things virtually, and just information is just, it's everywhere, and it's almost, you know, it's a lot. And I think um, some of the people on the line um, wanted to understand how we've talked about this, and you talked about some of your um, outreach efforts. Can you reinforce that? Um, how you've addressed COVID during this outreach process, how you've been thinking about that to make sure that the city's being transparent through this process. Sure, so uh, a few thoughts there, and I think that's a very natural question to ask, and we've thought a lot about it. Uh, so we um, we obviously, we we experienced this just at the, as everyone else in the world did, where we uh, adjusted and uh, tried to do things virtually. Uh, we what we saw when we did that is we actually saw a heightened level of interest in our initiative than what we normally see. I mean, this workshop alone is an example of that, but we've also compared to what an in-person workshop would be. But we also saw that in the written public comments that we get. We saw that in the uh, the calls that are now coming into the council uh, hearings that before you weren't able to call in. Uh, so we're seeing more interest and more engagement than before. But we also think it's really important to keep focusing on these issues. I think the pandemic has also reminded us, for example, of the importance of shelter and the importance of affordable housing and not falling into the system of homelessness and having a roof over your head. We've seen that in the area of parks as well. We've heard uh, very strongly from the public that it's important to have open spaces, to be, have an access, to have the ability to access an, a, a park within a short walk from their home. So we've really uh, responded to a lot of the the thoughts and the comments that we've heard and we've adjusted our proposals to account for some things that I think that we're hearing uniquely right now because of the pandemic. And then just one last thought on that, that um, we've also heard from our elected officials, our city council and many others of the importance of still having the city of San Diego be governing during this time because we don't, we don't know how long this is going to, to end and many of these are very important things that we're working on. So we feel that it is important to continue the conversation and to and to continue all, all of this work because ultimately it creates a stronger city. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I think to all the panelists, um, maybe on behalf of the ILD team certainly, but hopefully the, the people on the, on the line, uh, thank you for the information. Um, I wanna flip to the next slide because um, when we initially began this workshop, we said, here's what we wanted to accomplish today. Um, a few things inform you about the initiative. I think, feel like we did that. Share some updates, particularly since you are accepting that feedback. You've been doing it for months in a number of ways, and not everybody hears what others uh, have thought uh, and are saying, and so it's helpful to kind of get that feedback. Explain uh, how and when, and test technology. And we did all of those things today, and I appreciate everyone on the line and everyone who registered that's, that's gonna access this uh, at a later date. Um, thank you for all of that engagement. Um, and before uh, we transition, I do want to um, acknowledge that um, we did some new things today and it was kind of fun and, and I appreciate that um, we didn't answer everyone's questions, but we did answer the vast majority by kind of curating it um, by volume and by consistency of message. And so hopefully your question was answered. Let's go to the next uh, slide and see what happens next. So the planning team is going to submit uh, these items to the council at some point, and the council is going to decide when and how to proceed with um, any or all of these initiatives 
At this time, no dates have been set for when that's going to take place. Um, but if you are uh, actively engaged in the city's website, it will have the most up-to-date information. Next slide. And as we discussed, the recording for this uh, webinar slash virtual meeting slash workshop will be available soon and we will share it electronically. Um, and that will be on the website for the city um, after our session today. Give it a couple, maybe a day, 24 hours or so, maybe a little a week, but it will be posted online. Um, and we can uh, certainly make sure that it is accessible to those that could not attend in person. Next slide. And we said we would start on time and end on time. We started technically at 6.02. We are ending at 8.03, which isn't too bad. Um, we do want to honor that commitment to end on time for you and, and acknowledge you probably have other things to do. We cannot thank you enough for being engaged and connected. These um, civic engagement processes are so important and we are just so um, really, really wowed by the number of people that wanted to participate today. So thank you for taking the time to be with the city, with ILG. It's been an honor to have you join us and on behalf of my team and I think for the panelists as well, um, please have a fantastic rest of your week. Good night.